Uh, and now I have the pleasure of introducing um, Howard Kadish, who spoke this morning, and it was a, a wonderful um, what's new in my specialty. He's a pediatrician and uh, specializing in ER as well. And um, he went to Tulane University in New Orleans, uh, and he's um, on the faculty of the University of, New of Utah. And I was just looking at his very impressive CV, and I see he takes care of uh, children from head to pelvis. He has uh, books or chapters written on injuries to the brain, to the coughing chest wall, and the tender scrotum. But that was interesting. And um, he worked for it. I'd like to mention he was summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. And uh, I think he's going to go two for two with great lectures. Uh, thank you very much, and I promise you, since you guys are the diehards, I'll get you out of here at 5 o'clock. How's that sound? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about sedation, um, and we'll, of course, talk about drugs. But um, what I really also want to concentrate on is all the other little ancillary uh, aspects of sedation that we can use besides having to get to uh, medications. This is just a Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon. I don't have any financial relationships. Um, I love speaking about sedation. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics. Why? Because there is no run one right way. I may finish this up and you may say to me, but hey, on these kids I use X. And I may say, you know what, that sounds fine as long as you're comfortable with it. So there's no one right way. We can't easily protocolize what drugs we use, but we can protocolize our setup, which we will talk about. You know, every patient with sedation should be hooked up to a monitor, should have an oxygen saturation, should have vital signs those type of things. And we can always get better. I've been doing this job for 17 years, and I still have issues when it comes to sedations. What could have I done better? What I, what, how could have I improved this? And it always scares me. It's like flying the airplane, um, always sort of no problem, no problem, no problem until you have that one case uh, of uh, pure terror. Why sedation is needed? Facilitate therapeutic procedures, of course, if you're doing a lumbar puncture, if you're doing a fracture reduction, um, high anxiety level of pediatric age group, obtain high quality diagnostic information, ensure patient safety, preserve IVs, decrease stress level, patient families. And then this is really important, and that is what would you want for your child? And if you want, the, if you would go in with your child and say, you know what, I think I need sedation, then I think you ought to think about that on your patients. And I try to do that. Busy ER, gosh, it would just take me, you know, five minutes. If I do sedation, it's going to take me 30 minutes. What would I want with my child? I always remember this in, in my um, residency. We ran, we ran, were, uh, ran the ED. And I always remember this pediatric surgeon would come down and he would do procedures on kids in the ED and he would never sedate them. He never let us sedate them. Um, and um, then he brought in his child who had a fracture um, that needed to be reduced. He called down the anesthesiologist to do the sedation. I think that's inappropriate. Not that he called down the anesthesiologist, but that on those all those previous times he wouldn't do sedation, but for his child, now sedation becomes paramount. I think we should ask ourselves, what would I want done for my child, and then do that for our patients. Procedures help by sedation, you know these, suturing, debreeding, reducing fractures or dislocations, form body removals, telling someone's spouse coming home late, I use that quite a bit. Why is it underutilized? I think we have fear. There's the medical risks, of course, respiratory depression, aspiration. You have practical objections. It doesn't work, lasts too long, no IV, outdated ideas, okay? Hopefully we don't, re we don't believe this anymore. Kids don't remember. I have kids all the time that tell me about their experiences. My son, who, was, who when he was three, had sutures placed, remembers the experience. You can always just sit on them. Remember the good old days of the papoose boards? We can just tie them down. That should be easy. Cost and time and money. If you're doing this in your office, it takes personnel. It takes time. You may not even be reimbursed. Medicaid, for us in the emergency room, does not reimburse patients greater than six years of age for conscious sedation. We don't get any money for it. We still do it. It's the right thing, but you may, that may be an issue. And again, it's just one more thing for me to remember, for me to stock. 
If you don't use it, what happens? Suboptimal um, diagnostics yields or procedure results. We see this in the emergency room. We have patients sent to us from outside institutions. Head CT is unreadable because there's so much artifact because the patient was moving. Lumbar puncture performed, grossly bloody tap, um, 100,000 red blood cells, unable to interpret why because the patient was so combative. You also get patient fear and pain, more difficult repeat visits. We've all seen that. Patients that are coming into our emergency room or coming into your office, see the white coat, see the stethoscope, they freak, they hit the roof. Why? Because they've had bad experiences before. Parental dissatisfaction, anxiety, and anger. It is unbelievable how many times when I say to someone, yes, I work in an emergency room, they want to tell me the story of their child seen at a emergency room that they held them down or that the child cried or had a horrifically painful experience. Medical staff, heartache, need to send patients away from your office if you don't feel like you can sedate them. Recent sedation advances, we now have drugs, Versed, we have reversal agents for the Versed, flumazenil. We have new techniques, we can do intranasal administration. We also have monitoring the pulse oximetry, capnography. Um, older, more dangerous regimens for me um, and for some of the uh, older practicing clinicians, you'll remember the DPT cocktail, uh, Demerol, Phenergan, and Thorazine that we used to use um, on our patients. Um, we used to use chloral hydrate on our patients. Again, in the emergency room, we don't use those at all. Conscious sedation, we are moving away from the words conscious sedation because you know what? It's hard to determine what is conscious and what's not. Therefore, we now have moved into the terminology of mild, moderate, deep sedation. And for the rest of the lecture, that's what I'll be talking about. I will say, I would like, to, what type of drug do you want to use? What are you going for? Mild sedation, moderate sedation, deep sedation. And definition-wise, mild sedation, the patient's awake, the patient's alert, but is what I describe to the family as groggy or, um, groggy or drunk would be the best thing. Moderate sedation, moderate station, they are out if you don't stimulate them, but if you stimulate them, they may move a little bit, they may respond. Deep sedation, they're out and they're not responding and they're not moving no matter what you do to them. And I think, and we'll talk about this, that, that when people say, well, what sedation should I use? I ask them, what are you trying to accomplish, mild, moderate, or deep? It's the same. It's the exact same. You, the question was, is what's really the, deep, the difference between deep sedation and anesthesia? Okay, anesthesiologists administer anesthesia. ER physicians, clinicians administer deep sedation. It is debated about that in the literature, and we have issues with are you allowed to administer drugs that cause, that, 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 um, that cause deep sedation, i.e. anesthesia, but to me it's the same. They're not responding to any painful, stimuli whatsoever. What sedatives are safest? Sedatives are not inherently safe or unsafe, and there are safer and less safe ways to administer the sedatives. So, so the answer is, is it all depends on the drug, it all depends on the setting, it all depends on how much and the patient that you're using. It's not just what you give, it's how you give it, and that's really important that we'll talk about, okay? So any med with sedative properties can produce respiratory depressants. So they're all relatively unsafe. It's how we're giving them. Word on MPO guidelines. In the emergency departments, we don't have the luxury of prolonged MPO status, right? You break your arm, usually you're not fasting six hours by the time you break your arm. Sometimes we're lucky and you have to wait six hours to be seen by me in our emergency room, um, but um, uh, but usually you haven't fasted overnight before you broke your arm. So NPO status of waiting four to six hours before I sedate you to, f to reduce your fracture doesn't work for us. Recent studies have shown that actually there is no increase in complications with short NPO periods. And here's a couple studies. One, 905 pediatric patients. You had 56 patients of sedated children, not NPO, 15, uh, 15 of them, or 1.5, um, uh, had some vomiting, but no aspiration events, no link between MPO and adverse events. Another um, 
Another uh, um, from the Lancet, large prospective studies of procedural sedation and analgesia have failed to show any association, association between fasting and adverse effects. But what you are using to sedate matters. So I am very cavalier with the MPO status when it comes to Versed. Versed is an anti-emetic. So if you've eaten a Big Mac and I still want to, and, and you come on in, I will give you Versed after you've eaten your Big Mac. Ketamine is and um, causes vomiting. We all know that. If you've eaten a Big Mac, I'm going to probably shy away from ketamine because of the vomiting. I just don't want to have to deal with that type of risk or complication. I will sedate you, though, even if you've eaten an hour before, I'll just choose my, my agent appropriately. Monitors for sedation. <clears throat> Pulse oximetry, capnography, CV monitors, we'll talk about these, but none of these replace clinicians' vigilance. For us in our emergency room, we must have, and this is my macro that I say when I dictate, an independent trained observer was in attendance the entire time of the procedure monitoring the patient's physiologic status. What that means, there's someone who's monitoring the patient, who's not doing the sedation, and who's not doing the procedure. You all have maybe been involved with or have heard or read about that patient that is having the procedure done, right? The drapes over their face, procedure was a success, but the patient died. But that happens, unfortunately, and it happens more than I like to know about. So again, you have to have someone who's actually monitoring. That's why it's very difficult because it is time consuming and it uses up resources in either your office or the emergency room. Yes, question. You bet. That's what we do in our emergency room. Now we'll talk about because I know the look of, I know the look of disbelief and look of oh my gosh, there is no way. Fair enough. And we'll talk about. I think what you can do is you can say, all right, let's look at the type of agents that we're using, and then let's try to tweak that a little bit. Okay, and we'll talk about that. But if you're doing, I think anything like moderate or deep sedation, then I think you do need someone who is monitoring that patient, vital signs independent of doing the sedation and independent of um, uh, independent of doing the sedation and independent of, um, of doing the procedure. Now recognize, when I talk about sedation, when we talk about sedation, sedation could be I have pushed the medication. So if I'm using a drug like ketamine, I push the medication, the patient is sedated. I have now sedated that patient. I'm done. I can walk out of the room. You're saying no. then I can now be an independent trained observer monitoring that patient, and I don't need someone else. That's very different than if I use a drug like propofol, which is a titratable drug, which is a drug that I am constantly pushing in there. That's very different. Then I need to have an independent trained observer besides me pushing the medications, and that's what we recommend. Pulse oximetry, we all know it. I'm sure you're quite aware, aware of it. Only works if not moving. Um, we've done a couple studies of primary children's capnography, um, looking at patient's CO2, um, recognizing, of course, that when you sedate someone, we're always concentrating on the hypoxia or the oxygenation. Most of these patients during their sedations are probably having increased CO2. What does that really mean for them? Probably nothing. They do fine with it. Once they start waking up from the sedation, their CO2 will come down again, and it's probably not a big deal. We did a study at primary that looked at capnography, and what we did find was as the CO2 started getting up into the 50 range, then we started to see episodes of hypoxia and desaturations. So maybe you can start using it as an early indicator that this patient is getting into problems before your O2 saturation drops down. We do not use that routinely on all of our sedations. Otherwise, bag, mask, oxygen. If you have a complication from sedation, medically, legally, that happens, and you are not held negligent. If you cannot deal with a complication from your sedation, medically, legally, that's negligence. So if you're going to use sedation, you must be ready to deal with the complication, whether that's have flumazenil at the bedside or ready if you're using Versed or if you're using morphine, having Narcan, or being able to bag and mask that patient um, until, until either the sedation wears off or you can get extra help. But 
Complications occur from sedation. That is what happens. Not being able to deal with the complication, that's medical negligence. Increase. Things that bells go off in my mind when I think, okay, either this is a patient that I don't want to sedate, and I'll have to arrange for anesthesia um, to either sedate them or them to go to the OR, or that I'm going to say, I got to be a little more vigilant on this patient. Current respiratory illnesses, they worry me. These patients can get into bronchospasm or laryngospasm. I had a patient last week that I was administering propofol to that had a URI and went into laryngospasm, and I think went into laryngospasm because kept having post-nasal drip um, and, uh, and uh, was a bit, uh, um, a bit scary for a while. Infants, just the younger the infant, I think you just have to be wary about them. Airway instability, compromise, cardiac disease, instability, especially cardiac disease. If you have a patient that truly does have significant cardiac disease, I'm not talking about the child with the small little VSD. I'm talking about the child that may has post-op uh, post heart uh, surgery, is on three uh, cardiac medications. Those patients that once you give the sedative or the pain control measure, that's going to change the cardiac function. That will change their output. And so they may have some problems with that. Just be aware. Neurological compromise. Use of other sedating medications, right? The medications build on one another. And non-hospital-based settings, transports, dental offices, um, increased risk. Doesn't mean not to use it. Doesn't mean I'm not saying don't do sedation in your office. I'm not saying that at all. Just saying increased risk make sure that you can deal with those complications, have the stuff available to deal with what can occur out of your sedation. Goals of sedation, do no harm to the patient, minimize pain and anxiety, keep children from moving, use minimum sedation depth, and, do not, and try not to prolong duration of the visit. That's our goals, that's what I'd like to accomplish. Commonly used sed sedatives, We'll talk about anxiolytics, benzodiazepines, Versed is the most common, sedative analgesics, narcotics, we'll use fentanyl, most common, dissociative agents, ketamine, most common that we'll use, and pure sedatives, propofol is what we use quite a bit in the emergency room, less automate, less barbiturates that we'll use. Um, I think the, the next slide is, yeah. So I just want to show you a video. It's not a video of me running, oh, let's go back. Can you click on that? Oh, there's no volume. What they're up to at all times. And as any mom will tell you, they can be a handful. That's why I give my kids Kidstone Chewable Valium. Kidstone Chewable Valium, the barbiturate the whole family can enjoy. And once the Kidstone Chewable Valiums kick in, these kids kind of stay right where you put them. They're quiet, relaxed, it's a dream. And just about all you have to do is check their breathing every once in a while or just poke at them with a stick. Kidstone Chewable Valium, from the makers of nitrous oxide balloon animals. So that's the one sedation that I do recommend for our families, for our families. To the children. To children. Choosing a sedative, okay, so let's talk about that. What will be causing distress? Are we trying to alleviate pain here? Are we trying to alleviate anxiety? Anxiety, I'm gonna use a benzo. I'm gonna use Versed, CT scan. I'm gonna do a laceration repair that I'm not gonna have, that they're not gonna be in pain because I can numb up the area. I can use an anxiolytic. Or they're gonna be in pain. I'm gonna do an IND of an abscess. I'm gonna reduce a fracture. That's pain. Can I control, can I control the pain with a local um, anesthesia. So if I can I numb up the area? If I can numb up the area, um, then I can tr control the pain, but I still have to deal with the anxiolysis. If it's an abscess, much more difficult to try to control the pain by numbing up an abs abscess area. Therefore, I need a pain and an anxiolytic agent. How much sedation do you need? Mild, moderate. We'll talk about that. Choose an sedative. How agitated is the child? Everyone knows this either in your practice or with your own children. We have all our baseline. I have done laceration repairs on three-year-olds that have sat still, and I have not needed to do any sedation at all, and they've just been calm. I've had to sedate a 10-year-old, 
or 12-year-olds for doing laceration repair because they've been so anxious. So every child is different, and that's why it, sedation and what we use has to be tailored to the child specifically. Choosing a sedative, um, how long should it last? Do we want it shorter because it's going to be a short procedure, or is it going to be longer, longer procedure? What kind of access is available? You can give it by mouth, by nose, rectally. So we have different options of giving sedation before having to put an IV. Or, of course, we can do an IV or we can do intramuscular. What affects sedation depth? It's not only the dose. It's also um, how we give it. But also it's the degree of pain, how much anxiety they're in, the route, and, of course, the uh, patient personality. One of, the con one of the things I like to talk to my residents about is I like to try to give sedation to patients when they're down here, when, it, when, I, when their anxiety level is way low. And that way, I can give them a sedative and I can keep them down low. Once they go up here and their anxiety or their pain is way up here, I have to use a whole lot more medication to bring them back down. So if I can, I'd rather start with them low. I'd rather hit them down here as opposed to, oh, now they're really agitated. I'm going to have to use a whole lot. And then what usually happens is you just give them the medication. Give them more. Give them more. Give them more. Procedure's done, and now they're out, right? Now there's no more stimulation, and then they're out, and they're in your office, your emergency room for an hour or two hours, sleeping at all. So we try to get them when they're down. Sedative roadblocks, dialogue. We want to keep talking. We are very lucky at Primary Children's. We have child a life that will come on in and talk with the patients and help them. We've got movies. We've got videos. We've got sound effects. Um, and if you have those options, that's great. If you don't, try to, if you can at least, recruit other people. Family members, parents are good. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but try to recruit people to help the child stay calm. We want to keep talking to them. We want to use a calm, gentle tone. For any of those with children, you know if you're going to say to a three-year-old that you're trying to la do a laceration repair, sit still is a silly statement because they're not going to. We want to try to calm, gentle tone, and we want to explain to them what you're doing. And I explain to them, to every child, whether you're two years old or whether you're 15 years old, what I'm doing. Don't, I don't use needle. I don't use the word shot. I don't lie. I don't say it's not going to hurt. Um, and I try not to allow much time to pass. Story. My son that I talked about before who had meningitis. Oh, great other story. My son's got meningitis. Um, I'm on a bike ride. My wife calls me and says, your son, her son too, Ian has a headache. I think he's got meningitis. And I'm on the bike and I do this. And she, because we've been married for 17 years, says, do not roll your eyes at me. <laughs> Come right home. And of, course he did, and of course he did have meningitis. The point, though, the point was, he comes on in, he's got a fever, he's got a headache, he's got a neck ache, okay, and my colleague is taking care of him, and, and how are we need to do this spinal tap, and we talk to him, and I talk to him, we need to do this test, it's called a lumbar puncture, and it takes a needle, and we talk to him about this. Fine, and he's okay right now. I walk out of the room, and I come back in 30 seconds later, and he's now has thought about this, right? Now he's gone through it in his mind, and he's now, how long is the lead, how, how big is the needle? How wide is the needle? How long is this going to last? What happens if the needle comes out this way? What happens if I die? What happens if you hit my spinal cord? What, and he's got all these things that he's thought about in that 30 seconds that I just said we're going to do this test. My point is, if you're going to do it, try to get it done and try to get moving on these things. Don't let these kids perseverate about it because they will, and their anxiety levels will escalate. And, oh, listen to your wife. Um, and again, this is sort of that whole, that, that whole thing. While they're waiting, this is what they're thinking about. Dun, 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 in their mind. It's just escalating. Try to get it done as quickly as you can. Anxiolysis, parental support. Most kids that have been interviewed after a procedure done, they do think that the parents help 
very much and help most. We've all, and, and so I try to bring in the parents if I can. I try to, but I do want to give them instruction. I am very much like, why don't you hold his hand? Why don't, do you have a favorite song you all like to sing? Is there a favorite show or TV show? And I try to bring them in, but I try to give them guidance. I do not let them just sort of go to town. I give them guidance. There are times when parents are escalating the anxiety, and when I see that, I have to say, you know what, this is not working for us very well. I think your child would do best if you stepped out of the room. And sometimes you have to say that. Um, as far as you know, having parents in the room, I'm a big fan and a big supporter that I think in everything that we do in medicine, we should have, if the parents want to be there, to be in the room. Um, I think that them seeing what we do helps with, um, um, help, helps with uh, their whole perception of the medical care. Um, this is just a, sur a survey that said that ED doctors and nurses for suturing, 90% were in favor of parents being there, but as you can see, it drops off with LP and resuscitation. Though my, in my practices, if the parents want to be there for anything and everything I do, I will let them be there. I'll guide them. You must sit down, you must sit here, but uh, um, I believe that parents should be with their child. Distraction interrupts the CSF processing of anxiety. It can be done by anyone, MD, RN, parent, child, life, singing, songs. Um, I always love the thing, one of our child life people, they're great, they got those bubbles, you know, oh, actually they have those bubbles that have come out of the gun, you know, so it's blowing bubbles, which is always great when you're trying to do a suture repair, you know, over a sterile field and all the bubbles are sort of flying over there. Um, uh, focus attention elsewhere, tell a detailed story, ask questions about their family's pets. The point is distraction. This is one way to do distraction, but it doesn't really work very well. This says, if it were painful, could I do this? So now let's talk about different routes. For mild sedation, um, going to moderate. For mild sedation, I use intranasal Versed, and I like this as an anxiolytic, and I will use this on my very minor facial lacerations. I will use this on my patients that I would, that I need to get a CT that is not being cooperative or is being combative. Intranasal Versed, I think it's very safe. I start moving into the moderate, I'll start using intravenous uh, Versed. Mild moderate sedation, midazolam, Versed, most commonly used pediatric outpatient uh, sedative, short-acting benzo, anxiolysis, sedation, amnesia, um, very doses. But it's reversal with flumazenil, which is very nice. Um, and so it's a really good drug. We use it like water in the emergency room. Flumazenil um, is a reversing agent. I think if you're going to use Versed, you should at least have flumazenil in your office or the emergency room. You don't have to have it by the bedside. I don't bring it by the bedside. But I certainly know where it is, and I certainly know the dose that I'm going to use on the child if I get into problems. Dose pediatric, 0.02 milligrams per kilo, adult, 0.2 milligrams, and you can also titrate it. It works in five minutes. You will need to repeat it as needed, um, given that the half-life itself may be, sh if flumazenil is shorter than the Versed. So the answer is no, I mean, I, and we don't. Um, so simple facial laceration, simple facial laceration, uh, I'm going to use uh, intranasal Versed. Um, I've got my dose that I know of, of my flumazenil in my head. Um, and if, if things go bad, okay, I've got a nurse, we can start an IV, okay? A little different then, let's take the um, neurologically compromised child with um, quite a bit of secretions, maybe from um, uh, the neurological compromise or maybe has an upper rest tract infection. That patient I'm going to sedate, but that patient I would feel better if I have an IV in place and now I will use intravenous for set, and now if something happens, I have an IV in place. And that's what I mean by you can tailor it by your patient. And that's why I mean to look at those high-risk patients and say, okay, this is not someone I need to ship out, but it's someone I'm going to be a little bit more cautious with. Oral midazolam, I do not recommend this. I don't think it works. We used to use it a lot in the emergency room. I think the kids... I just don't think it works at all. Intranasal midazolam is what we use in the emergency room, and this is what I advocate, and this is what I recommend. I use 0.4 milligrams per kilo, but you can give more. Here's a study that looked at, um, uh, that looked at 40 children's sed sedation by the dose of, of intranasal midazolam, and you can see that in the study, they had 100% were sedated with 0.4 to 0.5 milligrams per kilo of the midazolam. 
Um, I do not get 100% sedation on my patients. I think I'm probably around 80%, and I'm okay with that. And I talk to families, and I say, we're going to use a very mild sedative, um, and it's called intranasal um, Versed. So since the uh, slide went, I'll tell you that we give the intranasal um, Versed through an atomizer, and what this does is, of course, it breaks it up. So just taking Versed in a syringe and squirting it up the nose is the same as giving the kid oral Versed, right? Just goes up the nose and down into their, uh, and down into their stomach. So I, rec so I recommend using this atomizer, which then kind of breaks it up into a mist, and you get much more, much greater effect and it, um, much more sedation uh, and uh, increases your numbers significantly. Intranasal Versed that you just squirt up just goes, um, just goes down the stomach. If you uh, don't want that, if you don't have it, um, then what I recommend is that you take a syringe with a, um, uh, with a small uh, needle and you end up dripping it into their nose so it actually gets into the mucosa and gets absorbed. But just squirting it up without the atomizer, it just becomes oral Versed. So it's a syringe, and then you buy the little atomizer, um, and um, oh, oh, what's the um, company called? Um, uh, if you just look up atomizer, I apologize, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, the, physician, the physician's company, and I, I don't have any um, financial uh, um, connections with this, is a, a, a gentleman named Dr. Tim Wolf, who is, his company is the one who had spaced here in Salt Lake, and I'm blanking on their, the company name, but atomizer. Um, so that's uh, intranasal Versed. So what I was saying was, what I do do is I talk to the families and I will say to them, look, we're going to use some sedation. It's mild sedation. There's about an 80% chance that this will work. There's a 20% chance that it won't. And when it, if it does not work, we will then all need to decide what we need to do with your child. Do we either say, look, we're almost done with the procedure or it's a simple procedure, we're just going to go for it? and in a sense use brutane or try to do the best we can, or we're going to pull back and then you know what, we're going to use a little stronger sedation. And I let the family know that this is my thought process and this is what we're planning on doing. That way they don't th sit, think when I do sedation, oh it's failed, that sedation was horrible. They didn't know how to sedate this patient. I tell them there's an 80% chance it's going to work, 20% chance that it won't work. Intravenous um, Versed, start off with a dose of 0.1 milligram per kilo, and then you can titrate the dose. You give 0.1, you can give another 0.1 or 0.05, and you can kind of titrate it as you're going along with your procedure. And again, remember, it has no pain control though. No pain control whatsoever. Um, classic for, um, we'll sometimes have our orthopedic residents, they'll come on in, have to do a fracture reduction. Maybe it's really simple or really, really something that someone's just going to push on. And I hear someone say, oh, I'm just going to push on it. Just give them a little Versed. Now, definitely it has some analgesic effects. I mean, I'm sorry, it has some amnestic effects. Fine. But it doesn't have any pain control. That's not the right drug to use. Intravenous fentanyl, we're starting to move more towards this moderate sedation. Dose, one to two micrograms per kilo. Um, very good pain control, good sedation. You can also titrate it. Um, of course, respiratory depression, chest wall rigidity can occur. Ketamine, now we've gone in from mild and now we're going into moderate, even maybe moderate to almost a little bit of deep. Ketamine gives deep or unconscious sedation. Derivative of the hallucinogen PCP. Um, and uh, provides great sedation, analgesia, and amnesia, and we use this quite a bit. Yes? Nope. Nope. Uh, these kids get this translite state. Their eyes can be a little nystagmus, which I tell families, do not worry that their eyes will be going like this. Uh, muscle tone remains normal. They can have purposeless movements. Um, uh, they can't have oral secretions. Uh, dosing, we'll use one to two milligrams IV. Usually I'll start with one milligram IV. You can use IM, ketamine. 
um, and I will, um, and that will routinely be three to five. Most of us will go up to five milligrams per kilo intramuscularly. My style, I think ketamine is a moderate going into deep sedation, and I would feel more comfortable if I had an IV in that patient rather than using intramuscular ketamine. Um, and so 99.9% .9 of the time, if I'm gonna use ketamine, I have an IV placed. PO ketamine, we did a trial of this in the emergency room, showed no more greater effect than uh, Versed, and we did not find it efficacious. There's still studies that will, that will look at it. Um, oh, a word about ketamine. Uh, ketamine increases oral secretions. Some people advocate using atropine to dry up the oral secretions. Personally, I've never had a problem giving a patient ketamine and then them subsequently choking, drowning, and having a respiratory issue because they had so much increased secretions. Therefore, for ketamine, I do not use atropine. And then there's this emergence response. Um, everyone has great stories. I remember this cute little gal. She was 12 years old, putting in a chest tube, had to give her ketamine. She was in our resuscitation bay with another family over in the other bay. As she's waking up from her ketamine, she starts letting loose F-bombs left and right. Boom, boom, you know. And uh, the family, of course, their parents, they're just, uh, you know, uh, uh, totally appalled. And everyone in the whole emergency room is she's just letting loose. Um, they can have an emergence reaction. They can become combative. They can uh, um, uh, start yelling. Um, and we used to give midazolam or Versed for that. Uh, there's been some nice studies that have shown that it doesn't decrease the emergence reaction. Um, but what Versed does in these studies did show was that it decreased vomiting. And ketamine we know causes vomiting. So I use ketamine and then I also use Versed, but I don't use it to decrease the emergence reaction because it doesn't help. But I do use it to decrease the amount of vomiting these patients can have with the ketamine. I like ketamine, rapid onset, short duration. Airway reflexes are usually um, preserved. You can give it IV or IM. Um, we have had some cases where we've had patients that have been so combative, so out of control, that we couldn't get an IV in them, that we've had to kind of do the Marlin Perkins Wild Bill, do the you know tackle, hit them with the IM ketamine, get them sedated, and then put an IV in, and then do what we have to do. Um, and minimal respiratory depression for the amount of degree of sedation that you get with ketamine. So we use it quite a bit. Disadvantage, can be a respiratory depressant, really it's not. Emergence reactions, we talked about that. Gag reflex, sensitize, increased amount of oral secretions. Um, difficult to use for scans because they have these non-purposeful movements so they can still be moving. Um, and we don't have a reversal agent, but it's pretty safe. Propofol, propofol, another drug that we use in the emergency room quite frequently, um, released in 1989. Polden, ultra short duration sedative and hypnotic. It's amnestic, it's got anti-convulsant properties. We will use it actually for our patients that are in status that have failed multiple lines of therapy with our seizures. Unrelated to barbiturates, looks white. Everyone's seen propofol. Um, initial dose, what we do in the emergency room, everyone does things a little differently, but we will start off with one milligram per kilo and then subsequently titrate 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo during the procedure. Propofol has such a rapid onset that the patients react really within 30 seconds of giving the medication, 30 seconds to a minute, but it also has an extremely short half-life. Now this is great when you run into problems. So the patient that I had that I was pushing propofol that went into laryngospasm that did drop her saturations, luckily with some forceful bag mass that we can try to break the uh, laryngospasm, but also just with time, she got out of it and we did fine and we didn't have a problem. Um, we didn't have a problem with it. Um, but because it's got a short half-life, if you're doing a prolonged procedure, you need someone there pushing the propofol. So if you're doing a long fracture reduction or if you're doing a IND of an abscess um, that's taking time, you're gonna have to have someone who's constantly dosing the patient. We do not use propofol drips um, and, and we use it. This gets back to, it is extremely, um, uh, uses up quite a bit of resources in our emergency room. For a propofol, sedate, propofol sedation, we will have a physician doing the procedure. We will have a physician pushing the medications. We will have a nurse that is charting, and we will have a tech that is, mo that is managing the airway. Four people doing a procedure. Huge amount of resources. 
But that's what we've, that's what we've done. Um, pretty safe. Um, this is studies. We've done uh, quite a bit of studies at primary for propofol. Um, we started with one milligram kilo, titrated 0.5. Um, we do have had some patients with transient desaturations, um, but we've had no cases of intubation, aspiration, or cardiorespiratory arrest from it. Propofol does cause hypotension. Usually these patients are asymptomatic. It's really quite amazing. Um, I've put some kids with propofol um, that brought their diastolic pressures to 15, um, but their heart rates are still quite stable. They don't get tachycardic and they do fine. Only reason why I do mention this is this would not be a drug to use for anyone that had some hemodynamic instability. So it's pretty rare that I use it on my trauma patients, liver lacerations, spleen lacerations, that I will, I will not use propofol whether I have to use it if I need to sedate them to intubate them or whether or not we need to sedate them to, for, another, for another procedure. Propofol has uh, albumin in it and, and um, cross-reacts with eggs. I routinely ask every single family, are you allergic to eggs? If you are allergic to eggs, it is a contraindication for using propofol. So please ask every patient that you use this on, are you allergic to eggs? Uh, we talked about how we use it, very labor intensive. Advantages, it's a great drug, potent sedative, titratable, rapid onset recovery, patient wakes up happy, no hangover, no emergency reaction, they're amnestic, they're anti, it's anti-emetic, and it also does decrease intracranial pressure, not that that is a big deal for our uh, orthopedic patients. Um, there are not many things that I do in the emergency room that actually I can look at the families and I can say, I guarantee you that, this, that your child will not feel pain. I guarantee you that your child will not remember this procedure. Propofol is one of those things that I feel very comfortable guaranteeing those things. Most of the time in the emergency room, I say a lot to my families, what do you think is going on? And I go, uh, I don't know, I think it's a virus. I say that a lot. Propofol and doing um, sedation is one of those Families are hugely, uh, uh, there's a huge amount of gratitude. Oh, this was such a pleasant procedure. My child had no pain, no discomfort. Oh, look at they wake up right away. Oh, look at we go home. There's no prolonged stay. It's a nice drug. Disadvantages, does cause respiratory depression. You can have desaturations. Does have the hypotension. Don't give it to someone that has issues already with hypotension. There's no analgesia, so you should give it with a narcotic for painful procedures. Some people say that if you get them low enough, and I also agree, that they won't feel pain because you can get them so sedated in, um, that they're just not feeling pain uh, with that, though most of us will give it with a, uh, with a um, narcotic. Sting does sting the veins, um, so patients, I tell patients this, you can give it with a little lidocaine mixed up in the syringe, and that helps. We use it quite a bit for painful procedures, cardioversion, orthopedic reductions, burn reductions, bone marrow biopsies. We use it. Uh, we talked about how, um, what I recommend as far as this independent trained observer, person giving the drug should not be involved with the procedure. Don't, so tips, don't wait too long before IV drug doses. So if you're giving IV drug doses and you give Versed and then the patient starts to wake up and starts to become agitated, you've probably waited too long. You want to be able to keep them at a low, relatively sedate level. So midazolam every 15 minutes, if you're given that dosing um, because you're doing a, a slightly longer procedure, is, um, uh, is probably too long. Don't wait, but wait long enough for the medication to take effect. Propofol is a classic example. Our orthopedic surgeons have become so comfortable that sometimes in our complex reductions, we'll line these kids up, we'll hit them with the propofol. But as soon as I push the propofol, they're already starting to crank on this kid's arm. And I'm like, whoa, 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 just give me a minute. Let me get them down. Because actually, as soon as they start doing that and the kid goes off the table, I gotta start using a lot more propofol to get them back down. So you gotta wait at least enough time for your medicine to work. Don't promise sedation depth if you're not the one doing the sedation. This is a big, um, uh, I guess, pet peeve of ours, when someone is sent in saying, oh, you will receive X, Y, or Z, they'll do this for you. If you're not doing it, and if you're not one who's doing the sedation, then you're probably best off to say the person who's doing the sedation will subsequently determine what's best for you. Milligram per kilo doses, think about those big kids. Once you start getting into 50 kilos, you're moving into adult range, so then you should start thinking about just using adult doses. You can imagine a 75 kilo kid for propofol. I don't give 75, we, I told you about, we start off with a one milligram per kilo dose. 
For propofol, I don't give 75 milligrams. I just stay with 40 milligrams. So once you start getting bigger, think now I've got to switch into my adult form. My favorites, blowgun, mild sedation, intranasal midazolam. I'd use this for suturing in non-critical areas. Takes the edge off, but the patient may still be active. Chin lacerations, chin lacerations, forehead lacerations, musculoskeletal lacerations, simple stuff. Moderate sedation, <clears throat> IV midazolam, IV ketamine, nitrous oxide, I throw that in. We do not use that. Some institutions do have that. I think that's very good for facial lacerations or technically, technical suturing. Lacerations here in the eyes, vermilion border, lips, stuff that I think that we really need to be technically accurate and really nail this thing. I want that patient not to move. And therefore, usually I'll end up using IV ketamine um, for those patients. Moderate to deep sedation, lumbar puncture, joint aspirations, small burn debridements, IV Versed, IV morphine as a combo, IV um, Demerol, IV fentanyl as a, uh, as a combo, painful, noxious, but short procedures, um, bone marrow, fracture reductions, LP, IV propofol is what we'll use. You can also use IV fentanyl and IV ketamine. Painful, noxious, but prolonged procedures, chest tubes, large, complex lacerations, I'll go with IV ketamine. I don't like to use um, the propofol for very long procedures. It just ties up our resources way too long um, for us to be doing that. General recommendations. Decide beforehand the real reason you need sedation. Is it pain? Is it anxiolysis? What am I trying to accomplish? What is the depth of sedation that I want? Mild, moderate, deep. How long should it last? Is this a long procedure, short procedure? Talk to your consultant if they're doing the procedure. How long do you expect this? Play the what if game, please, and be prepared. As we talked about complications from sedation, it's not negligence. Not dealing with the complications, that's negligence. Please play the what if game. If he stops breathing, bag, mask, flumazenil, I know the dose, I know where it is, IV. We don't have an IV in, but I've got my nurse, my nurse will be able to put the IV in, whatever it is. Do not use sedative medications without proper monitoring, and always use behavioral anxiolysis and local anesthesia if you can. Use your resources. There's no right or agent, dose, or route. We've talked about that. It's all very specific to your patient. Get experience, though, with few agents. You've heard me use the same ones over and over again, and you may say, well, hey, what about Demerol, or, or what about uh, this other drug? And I'd say to you, it's probably a very appropriate drug. What I've been talking to you about is my experience, what drugs I use day in and day out. And, but because of that, I'm quite comfortable. I know the dosage. I know the complications. I know how much to give. Get experience. Utilize anesthesia, of course, for advice, education, suggestions. Do not guarantee how deeply a patient will be sedated, except if you use them for propofol. No. Um, and do not be afraid to stop and regroup when things are going poorly. I do this all the time. Hey, things are going poorly. We need to stop. Pull back. Let's discuss options. What should we do here? And I do that with the families. Instead of just saying, things are going poorly, I'm just going to keep hammering away. Usually doesn't come out very well. That's it. It's 5 o'clock. I told you I'd get here at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Questions? More of a hypothetical question. What do you think about circumcisions? You know, we, we do cirques all the time, um, and uh, these kids are not, babies are not sedated. Parents are not in the room. Uh, we might do a penile block, which who knows how well that works. Right. The, the question is, what about circumcisions? And I think that's a really um, uh, great question and a, a difficult answer. Um, so uh, because of the patient's age, I just have to say risk benefits. And I would say that, no, I, I would not recommend sedation. With that, with that said, I'm actually a moil. Um, so I do sedations. I mean, I do uh, circumcisions. Um, I actually circumcise my kids. I know this is way more information than you ever really cared to know about me. But my point is, I didn't sedate my kids. I did do a penile block, and I do talk to families when we do circumcisions to say, hey, I'm just not willing to take the risks over the benefits and because you're a newborn. So that's why I don't. Specific 
Every single patient that I do sedation on, I at least speak to them, of course, about risks and benefits. But I do this all verbally. I do not have them sign anything. But I do talk to them, here are the risks, here are the benefits of sedation, here are the complications. And then in all my notes that I dictate, I talk to the family about risks, benefits, I mean I dictate risks, benefits, explain to the family they are comfortable with proceeding on with sedation. But, but it's a great thing, great question, and we should discuss that always with our families. Because from the sedation standpoint, if, and, and really what I'm just talking about is the propofol. And the reason for that is, is because of the propofol, I am clued in on giving the drug, and I'm watching that kid closely, and I'm looking at the kid breathing, and I'm doing all those things, and I'm monitoring them. But I'm also still looking at doing a job, and I'm giving the medication. So we've come up and said, we want that independent trained observer. Again, that's just what we do. You may, you may say that's overkill, but that's what we did. Because I'm performing a job. I'm, I'm using that syringe. When I give ketamine, I've given the medication. I don't need someone else. I can monitor that patient as an independent. But that's how we've set up our system. Yeah, nitrous oxide's great, and where I um, used to tra where I where I trained and where I used to practice, which was down in San Diego, we had a whole nitrous oxide system. It's a little bit cumbersome because you have to get the system, you have to get a breathing, you have to be able. Sometimes, uh, right, intramuscular ketamine, and we've had to do that sometimes with our some very combative patients um, to be able to sort of at least get things going, and and so. Gotcha, gotcha. Any other questions? Yes. Nope, and um, so we use Atomidate quite a bit for our intubations, sort of our, our, our drug that we use. And there's been a lot of stuff looking, comparing propofol and Atomidate. Um, and actually, it looks like it's probably about the same um, as far as efficacy, safety goes, and, and everything like that. So it would be a very appropriate drug. For us, we started on this ban, on this role of using propofol. Um, and so any time one of our fellows or one of us says, hey, we should do a study or let's look at Atomidate, people say, well, it hasn't been shown to be better, and so we're going with what we're comfortable with and what our system, but a very appropriate drug, Atomidate. Well, thank you guys very, um, very much for staying late and hanging out. <laughs>